Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us for the, uh, this morning's uh, call. For today, right, uh, we will be talking about some uh, counter updates for SGX's uh, third quarter results, uh, micro mechanics uh, first quarter results, Fraser Center Point, as well as Capo DC first quarter. As well for some sector and macro outlook, we will be talking about Singapore banking note, uh, some Singapore REITs sector note, and uh, Singapore bond strategy, um, STI, uh, Asian indexes, uh, indices technical pulse, as well as our Philip Singapore monthly. So without further ado, we will be uh, moving on, starting with SGX. Okay, so um, now I'll be talking about SGX. We are maintaining a neutral uh, call the target price of $9.28 upward revision um, and looking at the first quarter results. Uh, okay, we see that uh, across the board, um, three separate revenue streams all increased by more than 20%. 20 so there's a very good results from SGX, but we all know that this was due to the high volatility environment during, especially during um, February and March. So what happens is for the derivatives market, we see that uh, currencies and commodities futures revenue actually increased 29%. So higher trading and clearing revenue coming in at uh, 28.8 million, which rose 38% year on year. For equities derivatives, uh, it grew 24% uh, with trading and clearing revenue up 26% year on year to $65 million. So we saw that uh, for equity derivatives itself, uh, volume also increased 24% year on year. Um, in terms of the... Uh, in terms of the equity derivatives, there is higher interest in the Nikkei 225, MSCI Taiwan, as well as the Nifty Index, Nifty 50 uh, Index Futures. So they were up um, respectively 85%, 44%, and 39% year on year. So these are the three that most people are trading. And we also see a particular interest in single stock futures, um, although the contribution to the overall um, index, the, overall futures, equity derivatives is much lesser. However, um, it almost quadrupled in um, the third quarter of 2020. So what happens is we are likely to see SGX launching um, similar products. So in terms of single stock futures, what we are talking about uh, will be the DLCs, the single stock DLCs, long shot. Yeah. And for the cash equities business, we also know that the market sell-off saw a lot of people rushing to the market to buy. So SGX noted that there was actually a 50% increase in accounts uh, without any trading activity over the past one year, which traded in March alone. So yeah, so this means that all the dormant accounts that you see are suddenly all trading in March. <clears throat> so as a result, we saw that SDAV, the Securities Daily Average Value, actually increased 58% year on year to 1.61 billion in the third quarter. Uh, yep, and there was a 65% increase in trading and clearing revenue to 67.9 million and 21% increase in the settlement and depository management revenue, which follows from the additional volume uh, that was traded on the market. Then in terms of the uh, DCI, the data connectivity and indices, uh, it rose 26%, but uh, it was largely due to the 5.9 million revenue contribution from scientific data in uh, third quarter 2020. So next. Okay, so for the negatives, um, we see that there's nothing really much to pick on for SGX itself. So overall operating expenses kind of rose 16%, but uh, it was all because there was higher revenue. So there are some costs involved with the revenue. Um, but uh, I think a weakness will be seen uh, in the equity listing and corporate action revenue, uh, which fell 4% year on year. So you know that the poorer market sentiments now will continue to affect the market. So fundraising activities, uh, in terms of an outlook itself will continue to weaken. However, uh, for the financial year 2020 itself, um, SGX has already beat the entire uh, financial year 2019, even with just three quarters. So what we notice is that for primary listings, it actually raised 2.2 billion versus 1.7 billion a year ago. For secondary listing, we actually uh, SGX actually raised 7.6 uh, billion versus 4.7 billion in 2019 itself. Uh, moving forward, there are some delayed listings, so we don't know when the market will, valuations-wise, will improve such that the listings will come back to the market. In terms of the outlook itself, uh, SGX will continue to benefit from heightened volatility as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. However, 
um, please, uh, we like to note also that um, because the third quarter itself, we saw particularly large interest in dormant accounts. Um, when we are talking about fresh funds in the injection from the dormant retail investors, it's unlikely to be sustainable unless these dormant retail investors suddenly become very active traders. Uh, and we also do see that in terms of the April itself, current numbers itself, in terms of the SDAV, it has already fallen off by about 20 to 30% for the single month compared to March itself. We don't know how much of it is seasonality, um, but yeah, that is definitely showing um, that maybe the volatility has peaked and started to uh, taper off. In terms of investment actions, uh, like I was saying, we continue to maintain neutral with an upward revision of target price to $9.28. Uh, this was because we, uh, the Stella third quarter saw us revising our full year earnings by 8%. So uh, SGX also maintained a quarterly interim dividend of 7.5 cents, which was maintained. Uh, and at the current price, we all know that it's short up. It's about uh, currently 3.1%. Um, currently yeah, at 3.1%, it is not very attractive. And um, even though they have already, like their earnings already beat market expectations by 38%, but the dividend uh, only maintained. So probably we saw some investors uh, taking profit last Friday. So now I'll be talking about the Singapore banking note. Um, we'll just be talking a short one about uh, Hin Leong training private limited's default, as well as the impact on the banks itself. So just a recount of what happened. On 9th of April, we saw that uh, Hin Leong uh, was refused borrowing from two lenders as rumors of the company facing some financial difficulties surfaced in the market. Um, subsequently, um, there was a report coming out that uh, showed that Hon Hin Leong Trading sorry, uh, owed US $3 billion to 23 separate lenders, while their assets currently only stands at about $700 million. So that's a far cry from the amount of, uh, old, uh, amount of debt that they have. So they also failed to report a US $800 million worth of losses uh, arising from derivatives trading over the past few years. Uh, so it's not a one-off thing, it's been a while. And for Hindon Trading, they also sold some inventory that was held as collateral. So this means that some of the lenders might not be able to get back their money from, might not be able to salvage anything from their collateral uh, since they do not have the inventory that is supposed to be held as collateral now. So right now, uh, there is a police investigation launch. And on 20th of April, uh, what happened, we saw that uh, Hinlong Trading actually filed uh, filed for bankruptcy. Sorry, I hope it, I'm trying to be louder now. Okay. Uh, but the latest move came on uh, Thursday, last Thursday, uh, where Hin Long actually filed for this judicial management and appointed PwC as the judicial management manager. Sorry. So what happens when um, Hin Long uh, appointed PwC as the judicial manager was that um, PwC will actually come in and take over the company for 180 days uh, since, the, since the approval. And they will try to turn the company around, turn the business around, and hopefully the banks will be able to salvage some value of um, Hin Leong Trading. Uh, yeah. Okay, so when we look at this, right, uh, the judicial management that was filed by Hin Leong was actually under the advice of the local lenders, and not, not the local lenders, sorry, all the different lenders, the 23 separate lenders. So basically, they took a consensus from the banks and the banks advise them that, oh, why not go for this judicial management route? Hopefully trying to salvage some value for the banks themselves like in terms of their debt. Uh, so what we see for the local lenders wise, um, the highest exposure to Hin Leong will be coming from DBS and OCBC at 20, 290 million USD and 240 million USD respectively. And when we take a look at the impact on the FY20 earnings, we see that it's about, uh, four to seven percent uh, year on year. So in terms of the short term pinch, definitely when uh, if the banks have to make a higher allowances for this default, it will definitely cause some issues to the entire year's earnings. And we are trying, uh, we are expecting it, the allowances to be booked in either second quarter or the third quarter of uh, 2020. However, when we talk about uh, the long term outlook in terms of exposure to the oil and gas industry, I believe that uh, the Overall, it will be quite limited because as of 2017, um, the banks have already uh, catered for up to a like, few billion dollars worth of uh, allowances in terms of exposure to the oil and gas industry. 
Yeah, so and that's all for me for Hin Yong trading. Right now, I'll pass the time uh, to Natalie, who will be talking about Fraser Center Point. Hi, good morning. So Fraser's released their 2Q uh, 2020 results last Thursday, uh, the 23rd of April. Distribution, uh, distributable income came in at $36 million. This was 25% higher due to the acquisition of a 40% stake in Waterway Point uh, in July of 2019, as well as the 24.8% stake in PGIM ARF. Uh, these these two uh, acquisitions were actually accounted for as uh, associates. So, um, however, FCT chose to retain fifty percent of the distributable income, equivalent to eighteen million dollars, uh, resulting in a forty nine percent fall in DPU. So, this eighteen million dollars were retained for cash flow needs in lieu of the potential cash flow mismatch from rental deferments and the lower revenue for for, for from the one month rental rebates offered to tenants. On the positive side. 23% of NLA has been renewed uh, year to date with a rental reversion of about 5%. So most of these rental reversions were locked in in, uh, in the previous quarter. So the bulk of the, uh, the, bulk of the 33% of leases expiring in FY 2020, uh, sorry, this 23% this of um, rental rents that have been renegotiated uh, forms the bulk of the 33% of leases that were expiring in 2020. So um, presently, um, there's still 11% of renewals by GRI that remain for the year. On the negative side, uh, impacted by COVID uh, outbreak in February and March, the tenant sales fell by 2 to 10% across larger malls. Footfall was lower by 10% for larger malls and 5% for smaller malls as, shop as shoppers avoided uh, crowded areas. So FCT's tenant sales um, actually outperform those of their central peers. Uh, for example, uh, Suntech Reed's tenant sales for the quarter ending 31st March fell by 20%, while tenant sales at OUECT's Mandarin Gallery fell by fell between 30 to 40% uh, for February of 2020. Uh, we also know on the negative side that portfolio occupancy fell by 0.4 percentage points to 96.1%, and this was due to two non-renewals and one pre-termination of space at Changi City Point. So we note that um, there will be longer lease renewal negotiations and weaker rental reversions expected for the rest of the year, given the weakened financial standing of tenants. So Singapore actually announced the extension of the circuit breaker by one month on the 21st of April. So this was two days before um, FCT released their results. Prior to the extension of the lockdown, uh, the Fraser's group had had announced a one-month rental rebate for tenants, which will cost FCT uh, about $17 million. So with this extension of the circuit breaker, it is likely that free, the Fraser's Group may offer additional rental reliefs, especially for tenants who are unable to trade during the circuit breaker. So by our calculations, right, this additional one month of rental rebates will lower our FY20 DPU by 11%. We maintain our accumulate call, but we lower our forecast to reflect the rental rebates and the weaker retail outlook. We increase our cost of equity assumption by 105 basis points to 7.6%. Uh, so the actually the one month rental rebates will lower the DPU by 11%. However, we take into consideration the potential retention of uh, distributable income uh, into 2021. So hence our 2020 uh, DPU was cut by 22.6%. Okay, moving on to our next counter, which is Capital DC. <clears throat> Capital DC has uh, elected half yearly reporting. So this is their 1Q uh, operational update, uh, which, which they released on, the, on Tuesday, 21st of April. On the positive side, the operating metrics remain strong. KDC has an interest coverage of 12.8 uh, times and a portfolio occupancy of 95.7 times. The lower gearing of 32.2% also affords KDC a debt headroom of $377 million. Uh, and as you can see, the gross revenue actually increased by about 26, uh, 26%. And this was due to the contribution from uh, Capital DC4 and uh, Data Center 1. These are the two assets uh, in Singapore that was acquired in the last quarter of uh, 2019. So we also note that demand for demand for data centers uh, remains strong. And the management shared that they're expecting higher data traffic um, due to telecommuting during the COVID-19 uh, lockdown. So another positive we noted is that uh, for the asset, uh, in Singapore, which is uh, Capital DC5, which is currently undergoing AEI to convert about 15.8% of vacant non-DC space to data center worthy space. Um, they have actually secured, they actually have, they have actually um, already 
fully committed this space. So it will increase occupancies from 84.2% to 100% uh, post completion of the AEI. So on the negative side, the lockdowns imposed due to COVID-19 has led to delays in AEIs, uh, asset enhancement initiatives, as well as development timelines. So figure one shows the four AEIs and developments that are ongoing presently. And these AEIs, uh, the completions will be delayed by about four to six weeks for Ireland and about six, eight weeks for Singapore due to the lockdown. And KDC's occupancy at uh, KDC2 fell from 100% to 93% um, due to the downsizing upon renewal of the lease. So this downsizing was actually due to the end tenant's client not renewing their services with um, the tenant. So the, there was excess space that was then re returned. However, the, man the management did share that the remaining lease, uh, remaining space was renewed on a longer lease term. So that's the mild positive there. <clears throat> we downgraded C Capital DC to neutral due to the share price uh, appreciation. We raised our target price, adjusting for the, adjusting our estimates upwards to reflect the acquisition of Kelsterbach DC, which is a Germany asset, um, and the conversion of two floors of Shell and Core space at DC1 to fully fitted leases. We also lowered our cost of equity by 100 basis points to reflect the lower interest rate environment. And uh, we lower our beta slightly as we believe the data center asset class should be less sensitive to the market factors. So we, we still like the data center asset class due to its future ready characteristics and growing pace of cloud and technology adoption, as well as the limited supply. However, uh, okay, while we like KDC for these reasons, the strong share price appreciation has compressed yields to 3% which are not compelling. Hence, we are, we are recommending accumulating on pullback. So for, for FY20 and FY21, the yields are about 3.7% and 3.9%. Um, we do note that this is actually similar to the use of the US uh, listed data center REITs uh, as seen in figure two. So for these US listed uh, DC REITs, um, the yields are about 1.5% to 4.1%. So depending on whether or not this three, this three to 4% yield is sufficient uh, for investors to, to actually get a position in KDC. Otherwise, actually, this is roughly how data center REITs have been priced um, in other markets. So moving on to a quick update on some of the new legislations imposed by the respective regulatory bodies in response to the RITAS press release regarding COVID-19. <coughs> So to recap, uh, the COVID-19 uh, temporary measure bill was passed in Parliament on the 7th of April. So this bill actually allows for six months rental deferment for tenants who have been materially impacted by COVID-19. So that means landlords are unable to take legal action against their tenant or evict their tenants. And this will cause a cash flow mismatch and potentially higher bad debt risk for SREITs, which may then lead to asset deteriorations. As uh, the REITs will be in danger of exceeding their leverage limits or breaching their interest coverage ratios uh, on their loan covenants. So three of the measures that were implemented to help SREITs during this period, um, one of them, <clears throat> so the Ministry of Finance and IRAS announced the extension of the timeline for REITs to distribute at least 90% of their earnings. So it has been, this timeline has been increased from three months to 12 months, <clears throat> basically a year. So MAS also uh, raised the leverage limit for SREITs from 45% to 50%. And initially, this 50% higher leverage limit was to be allowed only for REITs that have a higher interest coverage ratio of 2.5 times. So this prerequisite has been deferred until January 2021, uh, sorry, January 2022. Um, SGX Redco also announced an enhanced share issue limit which allows main board issuers to issue shares and convertible securities up to 100% of share capital. So this will enable um, REITs to, uh, to accelerate their fundraising efforts. So what do we think? Uh, we, we think that we may see an, uh, a, a deterioration in asset quality should arrears pile up, uh, and REITs may start to recognize bad debts uh, provisioning earlier. The increased leverage limits will also provide for revaluation uh, downside as well as allow room for bad debt provisioning. And this COVID situation, along with the lower interest rates and the higher gearing limits, may actually be the re-rating catalyst that helps SREITs overcome their prudence uh, and tap into their gearing headroom for future acquisitions. So that's all for me, and I'll pass on the time to Tia Hui, who will talk about some of the master leases in the SREITs. Yeah, um, yeah, hi. 
Thanks, Ned. So today we'll be talking about Master Lee's exposures in the street sector following the recent happenings of um, Eagle Hospitality Trust. Um, Eagle's trading was voluntarily suspended on 24th March after defaulting on a 314 million loan. This was highlighted after Urban Commons, its sponsor and master lessee, did not place the full sum of the security deposits under the master lease agreement and pay stipulated rentals since December 2019. The lease term was supposed to be for 20 years and the rental deposit was nine months worth of fixed rent. In light of the situation, we compiled a list of REITs with master leases. Our findings are as follows. For healthcare and hospitality REITs, it is common for the master lessee to be part of the sponsor subsidiary of growth companies. They also have the highest proportion of rents dependent on master leases. Therefore, though master leases can provide a level of income protection, it is highly dependent on the financial health of the sponsor. On the flip side, um, industrial and retail REITs have less concentration on master leases and are usually diversified with various third-party tenants or vendors. There are minimal master leases for commercial REITs as they usually own multi-tenanted building multi-tenanted multi buildings, except for IREIT, which has a 40.1% single tenant exposure by GRI. Lastly, just a note on security deposits. Based on standard industry practice, one month's worth of um, gross rental is usually held as security, security deposit for each year's lease. For example, a five-year lease will require five months of committed security deposit. However, a larger sum may be held for longer-term leases in single tenanted properties. Now, I'll pass my time on to Timothy who will talk about um, the Singapore bond strategy. Hello. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, I'll be talking about the Singapore bond strategy. Okay, so uh, right now we are wary on callable bonds with refix. So because the reason is that they may refix lower in a lower interest rate environment. So some of these bonds are, are callable bonds, meaning that uh, the issuer has the option of calling the bond of redeeming the bond or letting the bond continue on with its uh, uh with its life la. so it has, they have the option to redeem the bond at the call date and examples of these bonds are perpetual bonds and uh, bank bonds and REIT bonds so these bonds have callable uh, dates and uh, refix clauses so a refix clause is when the bond coupon rate resets at a certain date based on the current interest rate levels so now we are experiencing a low interest rate environment. So there's this risk that uh, all, a lot of these bonds were refixed to a lower rate and then the issuers uh, will be less likely to call them because at a lower rate, they will have a lower finance cost. Uh, and if they don't call the bond, they don't redeem it, they can conserve cash during this time. And also because it's harder for them to refinance during this time uh, when it's a crisis. Uh. So they, there's this uh, this is, is in, increased risk of non-calls of these callable bonds at, during this time. And so the risk for bondholders is that uh, they'll be stuck with a lower coupon rate because the bond will refix lower, the coupon rate, and they'll have to, look, uh, have to hold for longer tenants because the, the issuer doesn't redeem the bond. So they're stuck with a lower rate for a longer time. So in the figure one, we can see that uh, in the table, we can see a list of bonds that have a callable uh, call, call dates they are approaching uh, in 2020 and 2021. And so uh, many of these bonds will refix uh, soon or so. So the coupon rates they refix to, you can see over there uh, on the right hand side, you can see the coupon rates that they will refix to. So how much they refix uh, lower than their current coupon rate would suggest a higher risk that issuer won't call. So if, if they refix to a lower rate, means the issuer has a lower finance cost and then they're, they're less likely to call. Uh. So if you see that, if it's a darker orange, uh, it suggests that it's a, it's a higher risk of non-call. Okay, so how do you avoid this uh, call non-call risk, the refix risk? Uh, is to choose uh, bonds with coupon step-ups. So if the, these, these clauses, the step-up clause is that if the issuer does not call the bond, the coupon will increase. So the clause will help to mitigate the lower refix rate. And secondly, to choose vanilla bullet, bullet bonds. So these are not callable bonds. They have a maturity date and the issuer has to redeem the bond at that date. So an example of these bonds uh, will be Gokulen. Okay, one bond uh, with a step-up rate. It has 100 basis points, 1% coupon step-up rate. Uh, and it's callable on 2025. 
So this, and because of this step up rate, uh, it has a U to worth of 4.66% and a U to call if they don't, if they call the bond, it's a 5.58% uh, coupon. So this bond has a step up rate. The next one is a RI asset management bond, 5.2% perpetual. This one has a 3% step up rate uh, at 2024. So this has a yield to worth of 7.05% if they don't call. And if they call the bond, it's 8.57% yield. Okay, and the last one is a Starhub Perpetual Bond. So this one has a 100, 100 basis points coupon step up at 2027. So if they don't call, uh, it's a yield to worth of 3.78%. And if they call the bond, it's 3.8%. So not really much difference because, of the, because they have a step up rate to mitigate the refix loss. So we have a bond desk uh, at Philips Securities to provide uh, bond quotes and to deal with bond trades. So for those of you looking into bond investments, uh, looking to find out more about corporate bonds, uh, you can contact them at bonds at philips.com.hg or call, it, call us at 6212-1818. And I'll move on to Weyren. All right, thank you, Timothy. Uh, hope everyone have a good Monday ahead. Um, so uh, today I'll be sharing a, a very quick summarize uh, technical action, uh, the Strix Fund Index, and then followed by the Hansen Index. So uh, let's move on. So uh, next slide. Okay, um, um, right now you can see, right, uh, is the monthly chart of the Strix Fund Index. So I did a recalculation of the, I, I did a reanalyzing of the wave count uh, prior to my report. Uh, instead of ABC, I did a five sub wave uh, corrective uh, downward action from 2007 to 2008. Um, I did a lot of like different variation of um, the wave count and then the outcome is still the same. Uh, we'll be still expecting a downside move, okay? Uh, reason being is because um, um, the, the price, um, price in, in, uh, in, in last month, uh, mid of March, has actually break down the multi-year multi support level at 2528, okay? So, um, and and although there's a rebound at the start of April, but we are but prices still remain close uh, uh, below the two five two eight uh point four four. So if this plays out, uh, we will see a wave C long term target at one thousand seven hundred. Uh, unless the the price break above three thousand levels, uh, within the next um one to two months, then we'll see that the, instead of a five subway down, we'll see a three subway. But in breaking 3,000, we'll see a prolonged, even more prolonged, um, longer range action. Okay. So uh, for, in order to see clearly, clearly, the, the straight time index actually have a sell down uh, based on our sharing last week. Uh, is, uh, last, um, I mean, two weeks ago, I shared that, um, the rebound is going to test 30.2% or 50% of the wave three, uh, the sub three wave extension. So, indeed, it did have a sell off at 30.2% and it formed an evening star. Okay, um, as of now, I checked the chart. Um, SDI did have a, a, a slight rebound, uh, but right not, um, unless the 50% is being taken out, uh, or I say the 3000 level is being taken out in the longer run. Then we will see that uh, the market, the, the straight time index has actually resumed its uh, up move. Uh, or all sort, you can say that it is a recovery, but right now we are still on a bearish tone. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide will be Hang Seng Index. Hang Seng Index has a uh, same similar play as uh, straight time index. Uh, I'll show you. Next slide. So um, instead, of, instead of a five um, uh, corrective flag, uh, <coughs> Hang Seng has a downward channel. And uh, you can see that it's, it's forming a zigzag on the downward channel. So uh, currently, wave three, sub wave three, um, sub wave three has been completed. Uh, wave four tentatively has complete as well. Uh, why? Because evening star uh, rejection at key resistance level. Okay, uh, you can see at uh, the two black line over there. Um, is uh is around two four twenty four thousand. So if if it continues to have a selling pressure below this uh, resistance level, we will see price uh, correct itself to the uh, support zone uh, highlighted in blue between 21166 to 20302. Okay. And, and furthermore, and 
unless 25,000 psychological level is taken out, uh, we are still uh, keeping the bearish, uh, bearish tone and outlook on the Hang Seng Index, on the Asia Index. Okay, uh, so next I'll move on to Paul. Uh, you share about micro mechanics. Thank you. Thanks, Baron. Uh, this is Paul here. Uh, just two, 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 two last uh, segments from us. Uh, I'll just share on uh, micro mechanics uh, third quarter results. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, uh, I mean, the, I know micro mechanics is probably not the easiest company to understand, but I will just, just give a one minute explanation what they actually do. Um, okay, they, they actually, uh, if you look at any semiconductor or, or integrated circuit, uh, inside there's a wafer die which is only 10 millimeter. You usually you will seldom get to see because it's packaged in you will see this black cover on top of your maybe your Intel CPU uh, because there's a ceramic package. But inside the ceramic package where there is the actual semiconductor, which can be as uh, the width can be as small as 10 millimeters. So that is what they do. So what they do is they uh, there's a rubber tip that you because you have to pick the wafer dies from the wafer and then place it into this so-called black package. Uh, uh, and pack it. Uh, uh, so what they provide, micro mechanics provide is that rubber tip. Uh, and it may seem simple, just a rubber tip, but actually it's very complex because it's very small. The die is very thin, very small, and susceptible to electrostatic or even dust. That's why all this has to be done in very in a clean room facility. And the good thing about their business is because it's a consumable. So this thing, because you can't use your hand to, to pick up this die or even use a metal device because it's so fragile and thin. Uh, this rubber tip uh, gives you margins of about 50 percent and you need to replace it sometimes every six hours or eight hours or one or two days because uh, there's a bit of wear and tear and because you it's just are so flimsy and, and delicate but anyway i'll just uh, i'll just run through the results uh any anyway, the results was, was good uh, as you can see from the pet me uh, it was up 48.3 uh, percent year on year the third quarter result the earnings uh, but because there was, uh, they benefited from a government grant of almost 400,000. So if you exclude that, it's about 35% uh, jump in earnings. And it is actually within our expectations. We were expecting a 40% jump in the second half uh, because semiconductor was actually recovering. Uh, in terms of the positives of the result, uh, the revenue, as you can see, is back to the 16 million per quarter. Uh, this is meaningful because um, in the record year of FY18, probably a record for all semiconductor companies, uh, their revenues were actually 16 million. So they're actually going back to the kind of run rate uh, uh, which they had a, a record breaking year. And the, the other positive was uh, there were uh, uh, three disruptions for them. Uh, the China plant closed for a few weeks, uh, I think two weeks. Uh, and the Malaysia plant is also partially closed uh, even until now. So even with all this disruption, uh, they still managed to, to provide, uh, uh, to, to enjoy growth in their business. Uh, because they are they're operating in you know, more than nine countries and they can uh, source provide the customers uh, or at least meet the customer needs from their other plants uh, and actually even their us plants is also under partial uh, they only operate at the minimum level okay, the, the only negative we had was the gross profit margins our first 50 is, is really strong but they were only 52 percent which is below their the fr18 stella 57 percent and even below our forecast uh, so that was the negative. In terms of outlook, uh, we, we are keeping our earnings unchanged because uh, we are still, which also means that we are still looking at a 40% jump in FI20, their fourth quarter earnings. But the only thing that worries us is that although semiconductor demand is strong, you know, with, or with, uh, with this, uh, with, this break, uh, with COVID and, and so forth, you know, everyone's going to the cloud and so forth, and also we have 5G. But we were just worried that there's going to be a lag impact, you know, there's a collapse in consumer incomes, corporate incomes. And we just worried there's going to be, a, I mean, who's going to buy a smartphone right now when you just lost a job? I mean, okay, but anyway, and also there's a partial closure of their Malaysia and US operations. Uh, we did upgrade our recommendation to neutral. Our target price is unchanged. And regardless, I think MM uh, Micro Mechanics is still a very impressive company. If you look at all the metrics, uh, their ROE is 25%, you know, the net cash balance sheet with the ROE 25, gross margins 50 plus, and also they're paying a dividend yield. So if you want to play the semiconductor sector, but uh, in a more passive mode, I guess, uh, this is probably a stock for you. But although the volumes are really thin, uh, but I mean, they've got a really good track record. Just that the volumes are very thin for this stock. Anyway, I'll just move on to our next slide. Uh, to our weekly uh, next slide. 
Okay, and maybe these are just our some of our technical short-term views. Uh, we, we will normally try to highlight some of the key macro findings and some comments on, on how we see the market short-term. Uh, okay, anyway, in terms of Singapore macro, uh, uh, the first point, uh, you, we did get an industrial production number, uh, which was really good. I think it was up 16%, but we have to kind of downplay that number because it was, the growth was mainly due to pharma. Uh, you know, last month, it was down 9 and then this month, it was up 16 But because the pharmaceutical sector in Singapore is very volatile. You can swing up 100, something swing down 30. So it's, uh, I wouldn't call this a real trend in terms of a recovery, but just that the numbers, of course, was pleasant, was a pleasant supply. Uh, the other big macro number coming out from Singapore was the number of bankruptcies. It was in March, I think it, it, it jumped almost, it almost doubled in March. Uh, surprisingly, it was even rising even before this whole COVID. So this is the highest since the, probably SARS time in August 04. Uh, the other data point that came out was our property sales. So new launches were well, only 660 units sold in March, which is down 40% year on year, which I think we all understand uh, right now where, where there's limited mobility. I don't think anyone's going to be buying properties. Uh, the other number that came out was, uh, there are lots of, of macro numbers, but I mean, you look at uh, for US, the flash composite number for market. So why this is important is that uh, this is the first time you, you are getting a glimpse into the April number. So this is the, the earliest glimpse into what's happening in April for the US. And the number is very is very bad. I mean, to lack of a better word. Uh, what we see is that the composite is 27.4, which is a new series low. And, and this composite uh, is because it includes manufacturing and services. Uh, I'll, later, I'll show you some of the charts. Okay, in terms of our technical views, uh, I, think we, we, I think we've touched a bottom. I think um, the, the, the challenge is, of course, Predicting the stock market now is, is almost equal to predicting the virus. So uh, good luck with that. But anyway, what we see is that the new infections are plateauing. We'll show you a chart later. Uh, it's not rise. It, it's hard to say that it's peak, but it's not right. It's still uh, like in a range, the number of new infections globally. So why we think that we could have touched a bottom is uh, firstly, I think the lockdown is starting to unwind. And unless the virus kind of mutates into something worse, we, we probably can see more and more countries start to unwind from this lockdown and it's always important to remember that uh, this slowdown is like it's almost intentional i think uh, all countries are shutting down intentionally so this weakness that we see globally is it's, it's like you say it's man-made because everyone's the governments are intentionally slowing down so it's like a you know it's like a turning on and off the off the uh, so if the government start to turn on the economy then things could start to recover then. Uh, so from from that perspective uh we think we are a bit more constructive on playing some of these FP center stocks. It's a bit speculative right now, but we think that, yes, you know what I mean by FP center stocks is that uh, uh, stocks that got hit the worst, as we know, transportation, land, air, uh, hospitality, retail rates. So, I mean, from my own perspective, is that I think probably there's a good chance to maybe start creeping up in, into these so called FP center stocks where they got hit the worst because of the COVID. But if this thing starts to unravel, the lockdown starts to ease, then it will be positive for these stocks. And like we mentioned before, uh, we're not playing on valuations, we're just playing on better news flow of this virus. Eh? Because the market is just moving along with virus news. Okay, anyway, I'll move on to the last part, uh, last, uh, just a week's ahead. Uh, sorry, uh, the, the slide before, sorry. Um, in terms of the events, uh, we, uh, in terms of macro events, there's going to be an FOMC meeting, uh, which is the Federal Reserve meeting, but I think it's a non-event. I mean, they, the interest rates are already zero, so unless they start buying equities, uh, then we got bio, uh, in terms of Philip uh, research ourselves, uh, we do have some uh, webinars, uh, as you can see. Uh, so you just go to poems and register them if you want, if you're interested. Uh, fourth May, we got biolytics. If you want to know anything about COVID, you can just dial in and ask them uh, uh, directly to the management. Uh, Transrines and SPH. Then, of course, the hot ones will be all the bank results coming up. Uh, so these are the dates, and most of them are released in the, in the morning for your, all this just for your reference. Okay, and this is uh, probably a, a, one of the most important charts out there, I guess. Uh, it's the, the new confirmed COVID patient, 19, uh, 19 patients uh, globally. As you can see, the highest has been 90,000 a day globally. Uh, unless this thing starts to taper down quite meaningfully, uh, I think then only the market will get some comfort. But you can see that it has kind of peaked at 90 and still bouncing around plateauing. So I guess if you want to call it positive, it's, it's starting to flatten out a bit. Yeah. Uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this is just a peek into April numbers. Mm, I, I, we normally do our own charts, we collect our own data, but this was probably already done. So we just took this from the, you can see there's a link there, it's the market. So what it shows is that the green line is a composite index. 
of what's happening to the services and manufacturing uh, uh, industry in the US. Uh, it, uh, you don't have to ask me if there's a recession. I think the chart tells you there is. Uh, the last time it, the green line dropped so badly was during the global, the O2 crisis. And, and, and this is even worse than the, as you can see, in the, o, uh, sorry, the O9 the global financial crisis. So uh, as you can see, uh, that gray line, that you, the gray bars that you see, those are the uh, economic growth. So when it goes negative or goes down, means there's a recession. So it's probably some evident uh, the situation now is worse than global financial crisis. So in the near term, second quarter, you probably can expect the uh, US to be in, in recession at least headline wise. Uh, uh, next slide. Uh, okay, this one nothing much, just to, just to illustrate uh, the industrial production. You can see the, the surprisingly the black line or dark blue line actually jumped up, uh, which was due to the pharmaceutical, but electronics is still trending down. I think this is self-evident. Uh, next slide. Okay, this is just the number of bankruptcies in, in Singapore. Obviously, this is going to be a bit of a pressure for the banks. Uh, as to Bankruptcy petition means application for bankruptcies. Uh, the surprising thing that it was already rising even in early uh, 2000. Uh, this is the last one for me. Uh, this is the, this is the property sales. I think uh, in March, it was down 40%. I think this is kind of expected. And uh, for the quarter, for the first quarter 20 is still up 16%. So probably this could be a, a slightly positive for the property agents. But I think moving ahead, as we extend this uh, circuit breaker, it's going to be quite, uh, you don't expect much from property sales. Yeah. Okay, I think that's our my last slide. Yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll open up to questions and uh, please uh, give us some time to answer some of these questions. We not, uh, yeah, uh, we try to give you an elaborate answer, so please have some patience if you take some time to answer. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, uh, there was a question uh, I will address now. Uh, hi, uh, Sing Song is your stock pick. What is a good entry price? Uh, you know, our target price for Sing Song was 141. Uh, so obviously, at 141, we were looking at 25 times PE. So at this current price, I think it, the valuations look a bit stretched. Uh, but we do know that um, the first quarter results will be coming out. So we think obviously the results are going to be very strong uh, because they have the, a very strong, I think they have a very strong Chinese New Year as we reported in the industry data. And with what's happening right now, um, everyone is actually... Uh, no, uh, eating at home and so forth, so they do get that benefit. What we worry is that once the results out, you might get some upgrades, a bit of momentum. Then I think we worry that the slide might slide down because the, the stock has done pretty, uh, the stock has done pretty well. Uh, so we think we we'll rather wait at the at the one for at one forty and below. Uh, but we do, we, but near term there could be a bump up. I think the results should be quite strong. Okay. Uh, one question is uh, when will the first quarter results be out? I think. Uh, like uh, I guess the main ones are the banks. So in our slide, uh, we've really showed some of the banks. I think DBS will be coming out uh, 30th April in the morning. Then uh, subsequent few days, there'll be the, the rest. Uh, so I think we'll answer that. Is, uh, another question is, uh, AM, is it a good stock to buy? At what price to enter for midterm? I'm not sure, we, uh, Viren, you can do a technical because we don't cover. Uh, frankly, I'm a bit, uh, I don't really understand. Uh, I'm not very familiar. I, I do listen to AAM uh, conference calls, but I can tell you I don't really understand all the technology, so that's why I can't give you a view. But if uh, Vera maybe can give you a technical later. Okay, I'll move uh, on to the next one. Yeah, uh, okay. uh, you, want me, uh, you want me to... Uh, oh, yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. For AAM, I checked the chart. Um, it has been, it has been uh, rising rapidly on uh, since uh, 19 March. But however, it's still kept at the resistance level at uh, two dollar ninety cents, uh, which uh, if you draw, if you if you use the use the measurement of Fibonacci, you retracement right, uh, it's actually uh, nearing the eighty eight point six level. So, uh, in my opinion, uh, do wait for retracement. Uh, I would say the next uh, next retracement will be at two dollar, between one dollar ninety six to two dollar. Okay, so I hope that uh, answer your question. Thank you. Okay, I'll run through again all the, the questions. Um, the next one is, uh, because of the temporary measures announced by the government recently, uh, retail and, and uh, retails and malls that are affected by this pandemic can defer their rental payments for six months. At the end of six months, if this entity still could not pay up the earlier deferred six-month rentals, will the security deposit be able to cover six months on paid rental? While we wait for Natalie, can you, uh, there's another question, can you show the industrial read slide again? Uh, 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 Siti, can you help uh, with uh, this? And uh, we have a question here, uh, what does coupon increase mean? Uh, I, I think, Timothy, can you help answer and a bit easier for, for some of the listeners? Yeah. 
Yep. Okay. So uh, coupon interest, uh, coupon increase is a is a step up clause that a bond some bonds have. So if they have this step up clause, then if the issuer chooses not to redeem the bond at a call date, then the coupon rate will have to increase by a certain amount. Uh, based on the clause. So some clauses will increase it by 1%, some increase it by 3%, something like that. So that helps to mitigate a refix down to, uh, during this time when the interest rates are lower. Then there is another question on uh, the Guacolin, uh, whether it's also 250k. Yes, all, all the bonds that I mentioned is all corporate bonds, wholesale bonds, so they are all 250k minimum. Um, just for everyone's understanding, our uh, coupon basically means it's just a fancy term for interest rate. Okay, a uh, very simple way. Okay, uh, 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 Timothy, can you just go through again the refix slide and then just give one simple example, like the UOB one, what, what it actually means, just for the benefit of everyone, because not everyone may understand. Okay, thank you. Uh, Siti, can you go to the okay. this one refix slide? Uh, thanks. Yeah, so for example, the UOB bond, right, on the in the, in the table. This is a UOB uh, bond that pays 3.5%. So, but because it has a refix clause, and during this time, interest rates are lower. So, if in 20, if on the 22nd of May this year, uh, UOB chooses not to redeem the bond, the coupon rate will refix down to 2.45% because interest rates are lower at this time. At this time uh. So, that, that's what refix means. Hi, so I'd like to take the question on the temporary measures announced by the government recently. Um, so the question is, um, retail um, retail malls uh, affected by this pandemic can defer the re rental payment by six months. At the end of six months, uh, if these entities could not pay up earlier, will the security deposit be enough to cover the six months non-rental period? Uh, so basically, um, most of the REITs, they will be passing on their, their property tax rebate. So that, that will account for approximately one month of rental. And uh, additionally, uh, malls like uh, F FCT, uh, sorry, REITs like FCT and uh, CMT, they have also elected to give an additional month of rental rebate. So this, this six months deferment period, it starts from the 1st of February and it covers six months. So that means it will end on the 31st of July. So that being said, for most uh, retail uh, REITs, they actually have security deposits of three to four months. This bill was enacted for February. I mean, currently we are at um, the, towards the end of April. So if anything, the the security deposits will be will be sufficient uh, to cover. The only month that will be at, um, at risk in a worst case scenario would be in July if they do not make their rental uh, payments. So that would be, however, we know that actually this rent is paid in advance. So in July, if they do not pay the rent, it is actually for the month of August. So meaning to say, there, there will be a, maybe an exposure of that time frame or one month or however long it takes for the REIT to actually replace the tenant. Yeah, because by then, at the end of July, um, they are no longer covered by this uh, rental deferment period. I mean, Provided, of course, that that the it, this rental deferment period is not extended uh, because it can be extended up to twelve months, uh, depending on the government legislation as we go along. Um, we also have another question about also regarding these security deposits. Will it be paid back uh, in the form of dividends? Sorry, I'm trying to find the question right now. Uh, also, will it be paid back in the form of dividends? Um, there, there are actually two scenarios. The first scenario is a deferment. So, meaning to say, uh, everything goes well, and uh, what happens is the revenue will be will be recognized as per usual. Just that maybe cash is not collected. Uh, with within like April, May, June, so revenue is still recorded, but there's no cash inflows. So, what the REIT can do is actually um draw down on the security deposit if needed, um, to 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 as, as a payment for the rents. So at the end of this deferment period, when the tenants do make good on this um, rent, then it will be replenished, the security deposits will be replenished. So it, it will always maintain a three to four months, depending on the read, um, kind of buffer. And in a very, um, in a bare situation, if there is a default, then what happens is the, at the end of the period, the the REITs will actually claw 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 down on this um rental sorry security deposits that they have collected in advance. 
So then, yes, the security deposits will be will be financed. Uh, will be will be used as revenue income, and it will be paid to the REITs. Yeah. But in any case, the rent that is accrued, uh, or the revenue that is accrued, will will well flow to DPU. Just that there might be a bit of a of a cash flow mismatch due to the due to the rental um, due to the cash flow mismatch from the rental deferments. Okay, I'll take a question. There is this question uh, which says uh, unrelated to the latest bank research. May I know the analyst opinion on the latest moves by CIMB Singapore to revise upwards the floor rate of certain mortgages tied to the one month cyborg as report by, as reported by the Business Times. May I know if uh, the local banks will follow suit and if there will be any impacts uh, long term or short term on the local mortgage market. Um, basically, I, we, we, we don't really have a, we don't really know what the bank, how the banks will react yet. But what I, uh, I think certainly will be a cause for concern is, uh, like Paul said, if there is a higher risk of default now that uh, there are more people falling for bankruptcy, then the banks might actually price this into the mortgage loans. Um, I think the earliest we'll get an idea of whether this might happen for the local banks will probably come out first during DBS's um, first quarter earnings on this Thursday. Uh, I don't, but personally, I do not believe that the local banks will make such a move like, because I think ultimately our local banks are still quite helpful uh, to our local community right now during these times of crisis. So, and the capital buffer that the local banks have built up is supposed to help tight through this kind of period. Uh, so I don't think they will do any predatory move onto the local markets right now. So I, I hope that answers uh, I hope that answers your question. I think uh, there's a little, another question whether I think uh, recent loans by the three local banks to Hin Leong will affect adversely its share price. Uh, I think generally for this uh, we can at least um, I don't really think I, I think that this is a um, this is a one-off maybe yeah, in the short term, very short term, one of lumpy kind of increase in allowances, but over the long term, definitely, um, especially if there's any recoveries that they can get back from the Hinlong, uh, Hinlong trading, uh, it will always boost it in the future. Lah. So it's more like just a very short term blip in the allowances and earnings. Yeah, okay, I think we got a, a, a lot of questions. Uh, we, we will try our best, because um, we will have to end it at uh, 12.20, but uh, okay, uh, we'll try and go, go one by one. There's just a lot. Uh, uh, apologies if we can't answer all. We will try and park some of these questions in our Stocks PMD website. Uh, is dairy farm good to pick up at current price? Uh, we don't really cover. I think uh, maybe uh, we will leave it to our child. Um, Varun, if he, if he can. Uh, for aspects, any advice on logistic counters? Uh, on, on um, so for aspects, right, uh, uh, the... Uh, our call on the whole industrial sector is actually um, on AREIT. So AREIT also has a, quite a, a fair distribution in in the logistics uh, segment. The pure play logistics would be um, Maple Tree Logistics Trust, which we currently do not cover. So um, basically for the whole industrial sector, we, we actually prefer AREIT. Uh, and I think um, there was also another question on whether or not um, Capital D, uh, sorry, Maple Tree Industrial uh, Trust would be a better substitute for Capital DC. Um, I think it really depends on whether or not you're trying to get an exposure in data centers via um, Maple Tree Industrial, or if, if that is your question, then um, th my answer would be leaning towards no, because uh, Maple Tree Industrial, their, their strategy when it comes to acquiring data centers is more of, they, they currently do not actually have the expertise. They are, they are, they are basing on their partner, which is uh, Digital Realty, to run, run the assets. So theirs is more of like a very remote, uh, in third party investor kind of situation. Whereas Capital DC is more of, they, they, they have, their sponsors are the operators and they have the expertise and the know-how. So, um, I mean, the U is, not very compelling, three three plus percent, four percent, but this is the this is the trade off uh, when it, when you get a when you get a more stable kind of asset class, yeah. And and back to the question, uh, where, why why not Maple Tree Industrial? If you look at it from a whole portfolio point of view, um, I actually don't really like the asset 
allocation of uh, maple tree industrial because there's a large portion of it that is actually uh, in the light industrial or the B1, uh, sorry, B2 health assets, which are like your flattered factories. So these assets are currently like most, uh, there's a very significant portion of it that is leased out to SMEs. So these small medium enterprises are, would likely be under pressure in this uh, situation as well uh, as compared to a Sanders REIT, which has a higher per a percentage, which is about 68% in the assets classes of uh, science centers, business, science parks, business parks, as well as um, high tech, high spec kind of assets. So, b due to this, and, and they have a very small concentration in the light industrial assets, which are the ones that have a lot of supply coming onto the market and will likely have uh, rents that are under pressure. So, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, I'll, I'll try and answer. Uh, there are some questions on the web, Zoom webinar chat. Uh, can I get detailed report on the pathology power? Sorry, we don't have such a report. Uh, food Empire, is it attractive at current price? Is it dividends coming up? Um, okay, Jeffrey might help a bit, but from uh, the problem for, for Food Empire right now is that a lot of the business comes from Russia. And with the oil price and, this, and exposure to the ruble, and with the oil price from here, I think they're going to face a huge headwind in the very near term. I, I think, I, again, we don't cover, but from, from my understanding of the company is that uh, when I looked at it the last time, the, the ruble is, has a huge sensitivity to the earnings the Russian ruble. So with oil price down and the ruble getting hit, uh, I think I would stay away in the near term for this stock. But uh, uh, but it's definitely a very good company because they, they've got such a strong market share in, in Russia for the instant coffee. Yeah. Uh, I hope that, that helps. Uh, uh, the other question, oh, sorry, uh, Jeffrey, you can go ahead. Yeah, yeah, okay, maybe just to add on a bit, um, just to provide you some color. Um, like in 2019, it was actually their boom year. Because like um, their Russia business is doing well, and then they actually expanded into Vietnam successfully as well, um, and yeah, the Vietnam the Vietnam market is actually growing very steadily and fast. But then the thing is with um, the whole COVID situation happening, yeah, as in um, like what Paul said, um, how oil is as in like uh, aside from the oil side of things, right? Um, the COVID situation might actually impact um, the Vietnam side of uh, food empire's businesses as well. So. Um, as of now, even though the U seems quite attractive, as in it's a growth, it's a growth stock, right? Um, so like even though the U seems quite attractive, attractive, and you know, the U and price seems quite attractive at like two percent, and like at fifty one cents per share, um, yeah, as in we feel that maybe, uh, it will be better for for you to stay away from the stock for now. Okay, I'm moving the rest on the chat. Uh, the other question is, uh, global farm companies who are who benefit on COVID? Uh, sorry, we don't really have the we don't cover them. We don't have expertise, but maybe when you if you want to dial into the biologics uh, uh, webinar uh, uh, on the I think on the fourth, uh, you can just ask them directly. They probably have a better sense. Uh, what's your view on Veletronics, UMS, and ICT? I, I think quite, I, I I think I like all three companies. Uh, 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 Veletronics, um, because of their huge cash, I think like one billion Hong Kong dollar, probably unheard of, or two hundred over million. Sing. Kind of hundred plus network. So, so we, uh, UMS is also doing well, uh, from my understanding, because the semiconductor. But I think they might get a little bit of impact near term from the uh, from the slow from the, the the shutdown in Malaysia. So, any anyone who has plants in Malaysia will get a bit of uh, uh, impact. You have to maybe operate at like we mentioned 30 40 percent levels. Uh, I still think I don't have the latest update, but I think they've always got a stranglehold hold on the renovation as well. But again, there all these companies might be uh, impacted near term. Uh, but again, we always remind investors that uh, the, if, if they do get sell down because of the week one or week first or second quarter earnings, I think probably that's a good opportunity to, to buy. Uh, I think important for us to look past, it's already happened. I mean, so you might have to look past uh, the FY20 earnings because you know, half the year is probably gone for most of these companies. But if you just want to price everything on uh, FY20 earnings where there's COVID-19, then you won't buy any stock. So you ultimately have to price in a lot of these stocks and uh, FY21 when, when the earnings are normalized. So so my recommendation, my view is just like some of these good companies like you mentioned, Veletronics, UMS, ISO team, uh, is just, just time your purchases and you know these are good companies, but again, no one is immune to, to uh, very few are immune to, to COVID. So, but don't price it on the COVID year kind of earnings. And that's a bit, uh, what's your tip on land lease? Anyone can, can help? I, I wait, yeah. um, okay, so for land lease, right, um, they actually have two properties in their portfolio. One is the um, the commercial property in Milan, 
property and then like the other property is actually the retail the retail mall you have uh, in Singapore three and three. So like um as for as for three and three right they did mention that um like um the mall will be operating at a suboptimal level due to COVID. So and then like because it actually uh contributes quite substantially to uh the portfolio's revenue. So distribution will actually be compromised and um they are um yeah, correct. As in distribution will actually be compromised. For their commercial side of things, um, it's actually quite um, stable because the tenant is actually, um, I think the world's, the world's number one broadcasting company. And then, um, yeah, it has a very, very long lease. So commercial side of things is stable for sure. Um, yeah, it's just that the retail side of things is not, um, it's not that um, positive for now. Yeah, um, maybe just to give you some um, info as well. Um, for land lease, right, it will actually be the only week that um, land lease will come out, the land lease group, their sponsor will come out with. So like if let's say um, there is a turnaround um, in this like COVID situation um, and the retail mall starts doing better, it will be a pretty good counter to look at. That's all for me. Yeah, uh, okay. Um, we will, I'm just looking at the, the timing of the question so that we try and get the earlier. Uh, is it right time to buy capital DCBs? I, I think we probably answered that. We are, uh, like Nancy mentioned, we are a bit uh, we're negative right now because I think the share price just run ahead and there are probably so many other reads out there to, to buy. Okay, uh, um, I'll swing to the next one because this is the 1201. Okay, then um, the other one is what's a good price to enter for net link? Um, our target was about I think 99, so the price really hit there. Uh, so probably you might have to wait at a bit lower levels, uh, probably like, I'm just picking a number, probably like 95 cents, 96 cents. But uh, all, but one thing, the, the, just to remind everyone, why, why we, we like uh, uh, stocks like Netlink or even some of the REITs is that uh, interest rates, as we know, has already kind of like hit uh, record lows. And with all price at, at these levels or, 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 or unlikely to rebound to the 50s or even 60s, uh, Inflation is going to be really low, and we think uh, interest rates is going to get going to be even prolonged. The low interest rate environment is going to be prolonged even further. So as a result, all these weeks or the or, or dividend yielding uh, our stocks will be uh, will, should will be very uh, attractive, and things start to normalize. Because it's going to be very hard to get anything with yield uh, 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 once things uh, start to normalize. Okay, um, do you uh, recommend gold ETF now? Um, Viren, do you think you can take a step or if you want, you can uh, skip this for now. Uh, do you think it's a good buy for capital, more trust and CDL? Yeah, uh, Natalie. Uh, hi, so for the question on capital and more trust and for CDL, uh, capital and more trust is uh, for the retail portfolio, um, they have 50% in central malls as well as 50% in uh, heartland malls, which is similar to Fraser's. However, as we know, the, the city malls are not doing so well, especially during this period. And also not to mention they have a uh, impending merger with uh, capital and commercial trust. So the the answer to the question is actually we do have an accumulate call on capital and more trust. However, I think our prices are our, our share prices are actually under review now currently. So um on the outlook point of view, uh yes, it is still attractive, especially with uh the merger of with CCT, which will then help to balance their portfolio. Um, the enlarged group will then be more, uh, will be less impacted to any any particular sector. So especially in this situation, where where the retail sector is not doing so well, um, the the stability in the commercial sector, the commercial leases will actually help to cushion this impact. Uh, sorry, the other question was on CDL. Um, Wayren, if you want to go ahead, first you can go ahead. Uh, anyway, when you think of like capital, more trust. I mean. This is the only time probably you can get a chance to get some of these, some of the some of these best assets in in, in Singapore. Right? Some of these suburban malls are, uh, cannot. There's no 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 one can replicate a suburban mall because it's like a monopoly. You know, you have a mall on top of an MRT station. Like, how many can you replicate? How many how many malls can you replicate? Or how many can compete with such a, 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 a an asset? So that's why like some of these capital mall trusts. Uh, for, I mean, this is my own view, I'm not at least, uh, just that we think these are good entry points right now. Yeah, because these are the best assets. Uh, I mean, if you think about it in, in Singapore, a mall on top of, of Orchard, Orchard MRT, 
So I mean, this the only chance you can buy is when you have this such kind of situation. Yeah. Anyway, that's my own view. Uh, right. uh, there's a question on Go ETF. Um, I did an analysis on the uh, base asset of Go itself. So for Go, right, uh, currently there is uh, some sort of like a top uh, at one uh, at one thousand seven hundred dollars. Um, let me check the price again. Uh, it's around 1740, uh, 1740 dollars, and that was the uh, previous two weeks high. And currently, right, uh, as of this morning, there's a sell down after a uh, uh, hangman uh, pin bar uh, on close on last Friday. So, I would say that if you want to buy for gold, uh, I will I'll suggest you for next support at either 1705 or even lower at 164873. Uh, because currently we are at a very very top, uh, ten year top, so it's it's not advisable to buy now, uh, because of the risk to reward ratio. I hope that answers your question. Thank you. I think we might have to end it now because twelve thirty. There's an uh, someone else needs to use the, and do a conference uh, another webinar. Uh, we I don't notice there's a lot of bond questions. Uh, I think. Timothy will try to catch hold of some of these bond questions, or you can just email to the email he, he gave it gave to you. Uh, and maybe you might even do some bond webinar next time in the future. Because I think there's a lot of basic questions on on, 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 on bonds. And some of these are um, sorry, so we can't answer all of them, but uh, thank you for all your questions. I really apologize to you. But again, if you have any questions, you can always just uh, send them in our stocks B and B website under the the community side, uh, you, you can just put post a question here and most time, almost all times, uh, we actually do reply by via, uh, via uh, through the, we will reply your, all your questions. Again, this is not McDonald's, so don't expect five minutes, within five minutes you answer a question, but uh, just post it in uh, the community side in our soft PMB and we will, we will usually answer if, if, if not 100%, at least 90% of all the questions. Uh. So again, I thank you everyone for attending. I re really appreciate everyone uh, taking the time to listen to our webinar and, and hope everyone takes care and, and stay safe. Thank you for attending. Bye-bye.